Hello, everybody, and welcome to Enterprise Sales Development. I'm your host, Eric Quanstrom, the CMO at Science. Today's episode is with a grizzled SDR veteran. No, not grizzled at all. He's actually super enlightened and knows his way around SDR teams. This is Hunjin Lee, and I've known Hunjin now for half a decade plus, and he has been, you know, in and around kind of like this space for well over a decade. In fact, was a sales development leader at Qualtrics, enterprise sales development leader at Domo, um, sales development leader at Hireview, Rakuten, Divi, and then Divi was acquired and is now at Bill.com, which is you know publicly traded, massive organization uh, where he's leading the inbound team over there. And so his chops are bona fide, and, and you're going to hear that coming through in the interview. In fact, you're going to take away a ton of tips and even learn um, some things that I didn't know, right? So like he talks a bit about strike zones. You're going to want to listen for that one, for how to outfit your SDRs for success. Um, the gas metric, which is something, again, I didn't know what that acronym standard stood for, um, and even how to screen for it when hiring SDRs. And last but not least, we touch a lot on extreme ownership and how discipline equals freedom, which is something you're going to definitely tune in and listen for when managing your own teams. So without further ado, here's Hunjin Lee. Let's get to it. So we're back with someone that I've known for half a decade, Hunjin Lee. Um, and, you know, we, we've worked together, but like you were saying, um, this is actually a unique opportunity for us to kind of like go a little bit deeper um, and have a, a deeper conversation than just two two guys doing business uh, together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we first interacted back in 2015 uh, with the platform called Pipe Desk. Indeed, you, you we did. That? I think it was with like Sean Burke and Dale. I, I forgot how to say his last name. Zawinski. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so, what's so fun about that? is that you, amongst um, a very small select handful of people, probably have as much of a feel for kind of the SDR industry, if you will, as anyone that we could possibly bring on the show and talk to. In fact, this is, if I'm not mistaken, your sixth um, company that you're on now, Bill, where you're the SDR leader at. So maybe... Walk us through a little bit of that history, even including, you know, your entry into yeah. kind of the SDR space. I mean, it's been so long. I, it's, I'm, uh, I'm shocked to say that I've been, I've been in the SDR realm for over a decade now, which is, I'm like, oh, that, that's a true sign of aging right there. But um, yeah, I've, I've always loved the whole SDR function because what I'm most passionate about is providing a platform for individuals that come from a diverse background and launching them into tech, right? Some of my top, top hires that, I've, that I'll always remember and they left a legacy with me are, you know, ones who were law enforcement officers, K through 12 teachers, um, individuals who didn't have tech backgrounds and gave me a shot to help mentor them. And then now they're high producing AEs, senior SDRs and so forth. And so, you know, I've always been in that mindset of SDR or bust. And so I'm very fortunate to be a part of um, the SDR leadership function here at Build, which acquired Divi about two years ago. Yeah, and, and prior to uh, Bill and Divi, you were an SDR leader at Rakuten, Hireview, Domo, Qualtrics. I mean, the list goes on and on. Some very familiar household names there um, in the mix. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, prior to joining Divi, we were actually a competing product of science. Um, I. I was a part of the executive team of Boom Demand. Oh, right. Yeah. That rings a bell. Yeah. Yeah. And so we did a lot of outsourcing of SDR work to, to uh, I'm going to say it correctly, for those who actually listened to the podcast and and, uh, and remembered the operations that we were doing there. But we did a lot of operations out in Puerto Vallarta, okay. uh, Mexico, and then Guadalajara, Mexico. Um, and it was very cool to see like what tech and SDR and how it impacted, you know, a very resort heavy town and what kind of opportunities it brought. Hmm. And, you know, it, it definitely filled my cup there. Yeah. I mean, literally it's as much experience in, in this space as, as you can have. What's changed the most in your opinion between when you got into 
kind of like sales development and now? Yeah, totally. So I started my whole inside sales, like full cycle sales, sales roles and whatnot at Qualtrics before, before even SDR was a thing. Right. And the biggest thing that comes to mind is how much the technologies have, has advanced over, over the last decade and a half almost. Yeah. yeah. Um, I remember cold calling to Australia, New Zealand, Asia Pacific hours from 4 p.m. to 1 a.m., looking for phone numbers on corporate com like company websites, copying and pasting them into Skype and then calling it, um, trying to get through the decision decision tree. I got really good at talking to gatekeepers. Um, and then that that all transformed with technology because then after that, data.com was then introduced and then how that came into play. And they all had uh, their purpose in, you know, evolutionizing and moving the SDR movement and B2B sales as a whole forward. And that's, that's probably the biggest thing that's changed in my mind over the last decade or so. Do you find, especially with what you were talking about earlier, like drawing the most amount of gratification or satisfaction out of helping career switchers or people new to the SDR role progress in the role? Is getting them tech familiar, getting them kind of like up to speed, letting letting tech be that kind of like mental prosthetic or helper in, in them doing their jobs more effectively? Yeah, totally. Because what I believe is that the the platforms, the technology are what manages the people. Yeah. And leaders will be there to lead, right? And so, you know, my day to day isn't really managing the people per se. That's what all of our other platforms are currently doing, right? For, for us, it's all about, you know, being able to really hone in on their why, understand their personal and professional aspirations, and then allowing the platforms to provide the way to go and hit those milestones to then get them to that next level. And when you say hone in on their why, are you talking about um, your team members or the personas you're reaching out to? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bit of both, right? Yeah. Um, right now, the hot topic is strike zones and understanding the persona, right? Obsessing over your buyers, listening to the same podcast that they listen to, right? And then helping them solve um, what they are most intrigued about. And so, you know, by honing in on the why of my reps and enabling them to be, be curious and to be very proactive in you know, understanding their buyers, um, that ultimately makes the impact where, you know, the, the prospects that they connect with, some of them will become lifelong connections, just like how, how we've been, right? Totally. <laughs> Which is fun. You know, you never know, like, when in business, like you kind of cross in various circles. And so what are some of the techniques or tactics that you're using, or even just the way that you coach that mindset? Um, into into your reps because again these are folks for the most part and I think I'm probably you tell me if it's much different at, at Bill but like folks that aren't maybe in like sales to begin with right they're starting anew or fresh or learning the craft for the first time right yeah so there's a book that I really like reading um, Radical Candor by Kim Scott oh yeah and she quotes Steve Jobs a couple of times in that book about, hey, hire the smartest people and just get out of their way, <laughs> right? And the current platforms that are like fully enabling SDRs and SDR leaders to function in that way, like the outreaches, the self loss, um, that, that's where the platforms have become so hypercritical for, for enterprise self development and so forth, right? Yep. Um, essentially, these platforms enable the reps to stay in execution mode. And our job as leaders is to get every roadblock out of the way. Yeah. Uh, one of the three pillars that I follow are, um, you know, there's process, people, and data, right? You need all three to drive a very successful SDR engine, mm -hmm. right? You need, you need someone that knows how to drive. You need, you need the process to really make sense in order to enable the driver. And then lastly, the data, you know, like Zoom Info, those, those types of, Good, good data is like the pure gasoline that you put into, into your car, right? And so we follow that model closely and 
that's where that's what I've tested over the last couple of stops is, you know, enable the people, move any roadblocks, and have them stay in execution mode. You know, I'm really curious too, like that execution mode, really that breaks back down to activities per day, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Is that how you think of like, you know, the, every minute that's not spent kind of like on an activity with a prospect is maybe a minute wasted? Yeah, essentially the activities are the leading indicators, right? And that's what these tools are designed designed to push and drive, right? The main metric that I take a look at, and it's where the real skills and whatnot do develop is, you know, how many meaningful conversations are our reps able to have with their, with their buyers, right? Yeah. And whatever, however many calls, how many ever leads that we need to get through to get to our desired outcome of how many meaningful conversations we have are the things that I really try to hyper-focus on um, for, for Bill and, and the last previous stops. Yeah, because then you can break everything back into that meaningful conversation. Did it lead to the meaningful conversation or didn't it? Exactly, exactly. And like just having or listening to, you know, the meaningful conversations, like there's platforms like Gong and Chorus that yep. are mind-blowing, right? Um, you know, with, those, with that data, you start replicating and seeing, you know, what reps are doing this very well and why are they successful and which reps are falling short on X, Y, and Z of the meaningful conversation metrics. And where can we, where can we buy training and development to fully enable the rep to, to run their SDR work, right? Well, and it's so much easier to like kind of capture those conversations that matter, that stuck, and then share them out across the, the team, the unit, the, the division, isn't it? Yeah, yep, exactly. And a lot of it, I mean, the platform and the rep can all be one thing, right? But the most important thing here is culture. All my reps, I set very clear expectations from the time of interview till they get promoted or, you know, go get another offer of, of some sort, right? Which is, you know, run your SDR role as, a, as an LLC, as an enterprise. Mm. You are the CEO, founder of SDR LLC, right? I show them, hey, this is what your overhead cost looks like. This is what the investment is from the current entity that you work at. Right? Here are the profit and loss statements. Here's why cost per lead and cost per opportunity are designed in this way. Our goal is to drive a break-even, let alone a profitable SDR function by head. Right? And because they have that extreme ownership and accountability mindset, it then makes plugging in these awesome platforms as a no brainer, as something that enables them to succeed rather than uh, another thing I have to do to keep my job type of mindset. You know, there's a, a serious amount of genius in that, um, that frankly, I haven't heard from other SDR leaders in the past, you know, so this idea of you are the owner, you're the, the president of your own LLC, uh, you Inc, <laughs> if you will. Um, right. Does that also give them the license and the freedom of like, hey, however I get to meaningful conversations, however I get to kind of like the outcomes, maybe it's sales qualified leads or whatever down the line, but like I can pick and choose or I can set my own course. Yes? Yeah. And it's it's all about, you know, creating the, uh, the freedom to, because I, I hired them to be their very best version of themselves. Okay. Right. I've seen SDR programs that give them a lot of red tape of what they can and they cannot do. And it really limits the, the ability to you know, perform at the level that they do. And therefore that, that ultimately leads to, lead to burnout, right? Yeah, because this is a hard job. Yeah, it's a grind. It's a grind. <laughs> Let's keep it Upwards to 100 plus calls a day, right? Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it's the big vision. I, I remember early on, and one of the tech companies that I stopped by at, um, you know, the, the co-founder there would set aside once a week to go cold call with me, right? And I was like, this guy is so much more above me. He's had conversations with VCs that I wish I had conversations with. And, you know, he's here prospecting with me. This is inspiring. Yeah. It, the, the fact of the matter is, is that SDR work doesn't ever go away after the SDR 
Right. Yeah, that that's probably a great way to build culture too, like is to have different folks kind of like leaning in and participating side by side, you know, forgive the war analogy, but like be in the foxhole together. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I'm a big, big uh, fan of Dr. Willing. And I listen oh, to, yeah. I listen to account of uh, extreme ownership and um, dichotomy of leadership and, and all the, all the great literature that he wrote there. And, you know, his whole mindset is if y'all, if y'all aren't the ones to do it, we'll find someone else who can. Right. And, you know, that, that culture, that mindset has really resonated with the teams I've stopped by with. And the ones who own it are the reps that are great. Right. And there's, there's that clear, clear distinction between good to great. There's good SDRs and there's great SDRs. And I'm on a mission to create the greatest SDR. I love that. And by the way, that's a, a thorough recommendation. Extreme ownership is a book for me too. I think that the accountability principles that are in there and, and even understanding how it relates back to Jocko and, and his co-author uh, Leaf, their experience as Navy SEALs, where let's just be honest, right? Like the decisions that they make and <laughs> getting extreme ownership from a, from a unit um, means the difference between life and death. Luckily in business, we don't have that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not exactly. quite as intense maybe. Um, but the principles still apply, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the metrics that I measure each candidate as I interview people, and I've interviewed thousands at this point, right? And really, it's, I call it the gas metric. And a lot of companies have different, different verbiages for it. But at the end of the day, it's considered give a shit metric, <laughs> right? And I love it. The individuals I've hired are the ones that are like, they give a crap about literally everything like they they put their whole heart and soul into it yeah right and in in all honesty it's like you know how do ceos treat their customers you know as as a cmo at science how do you treat your customers yeah right you, you treat them as your very very own customers yeah right and yeah i'm, I'm a big uh, yeah golden yeah. and platinum rule guy right like i like to think about how would i want to be treated golden rule in, in any situation, then platinum rule, how do they want to be treated? <laughs> right? Like, yeah. so if you're cognizant of both of those, then I think you're on the right track. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's uh, it's like the whole Amazon model customer obsessed. Yeah. You'll never right? go wrong. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean bend over backwards, right? Like in, in radical candor, the, nowhere in the book does it say, even if it's not the right thing for the business, you know, bend over backwards for the customer, right? It's, it's about mutual thought partnership. And those are the, the relationships that I want my reps to go and develop as they develop and grow more into enterprise self-development, enterprise self, and so forth. You know, it's funny. I think that there's a lot of probably our listeners um, who are also in sales development leadership roles who, who would be nodding their heads in violent agreement with everything that you're saying um, and I love that gas metric, give a shit metric. Um, I'm going to start using that by the way. Love it. How do you, especially given your experience and, and having interviewed and actually being your experience with interview platforms, right? Like they used to represent at higher view. How do you kind of like glean that out in an interview that, that the person that is before you does give a shit? How do you screen for that? That's a great question. What I, I mean, everyone has a different interview style, right? But like I said early on in this podcast, what I try to do with every candidate is set very, very proper expectations mm -hmm. from the very get-go. I go as far as, hey, you are my seventh interview today. I am exhausted, right? And I will, I will ask you a couple of questions and I will double tap on every question dig into every single question and what I look for are specifics and for the opportunity for y'all to be vulnerable with me so that I can truly understand like is this a want or a is this a need and then from there that's when they can plug into the program here to go and make sure that they're able to grow into tech space. So if if a candidate isn't showing you kind of like specifics or vulnerability then 
there's no real proof of, of them giving a shit before. Exactly. Like as simple, a simple question as like, why do you want to be a SDR at Bill? Yeah. Right. They can't answer is, well, I think Bill's a great company and I think uh, the sales program is awesome. Right. Yeah. Very on the surface types of answers. And I let them know, like, you know, as a matter of fact, like 90% of people I speak with give me that type of answer. Tell me the reason why you want to come to Bill. Tell me the reason why, you know, I could take a bet on your career here, right? And help me understand. Teach me, tell me, communicate to me that you're insanely moldable, coachable, humble. And at the end of the day, you want to get stuff done. That is a great, like, one-two punch right there. I imagine that's when people do start to get real, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, totally. I I have the brand here that my uh, interviews are very intimidating, which that's not the intention there at all. And people that know me out at the office are like, hey, he's like the softest hearted, like, butterfly guy that you'll ever meet in your life, right? <laughs> but I have to know, you know, like... Yeah. I've, I've hired plenty of bad hires where I didn't hone in on that. And it, it wasn't just, Oh, you know, they didn't work out. It was like, how do we coach them out? Like so many things that, that are logistically time consuming and resource consuming, emotionally consuming. Like how do, how do we avoid that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose truth in advertising too, like knowing what we know being, kind of like in the space and the grinding nature of the business. Um, you know, when, when, when you hit day in and day out and, and you can't find joy in the work, like you're just doomed. You're just doomed in this, in this profession. Totally. And what I communicate to my reps is like, Hey, the other one to 10, fuck there. How are you doing? And if they give me a low score, you know, I go into the mode of like, life is too short to go do something for eight hours a day with people you don't like a job that you don't like that life is way too short. Yeah. Right. You got to make a change there. Yeah. And, and find it again, the fulfillment in the work itself. Um, you know, cause I think that's the only through path forward, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And it, it's super fun to see, right. How these drugs transform. Cause a lot of, a lot of times people will get into sales because they're money. Driven, yeah. Which we want them to be money driven. We need them to be money driven, right? But, you know, seeing that transform to, you know, I really enjoy connecting with prospects and helping them see that there are technologies out there that can better serve their business, right? We're in the SMB space here and, you know, we believe here at Bill that SMBs are the heart of the economy, right? Fully enabling those types of individuals and so because we have a company-wide mission to go do those amazing things, we also need to ensure that the SDRs that I bring on to Bill have the same passion, the same mission, the same understanding. And it's not just, you know, they understand that the money will come. But the number one thing that they are going to hyper-focus on is being able to serve the SMB segment and help them grow and enable their you know, financial technology ecosystem well and and it sounds to me like you have the perfect metaphor if you're saying hey like day one this is their llc and they have to own it much like an smb would right like and and <laughs> exactly <laughs> you're basically like keeping it in a closed loop yeah absolutely that's that's a good call out um i haven't thought of it that way it's uh lee's mind is fragmented in many <laughs> many ways but one avenue leads to another but your point is they're full on ecosystem goes full circle. Yeah. Well, I think that, and, and you have quite a number of SDRs under kind of like your purview, right? Yeah. So I oversee the inbound function and then also a, uh, a blend of both bill and TV platform function as well. And, and it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people too. I would, I would imagine. Um, so tell us a little bit more, perfect segue into kind of like the inbound nature of the SDR role, which, you know, I, I don't think it's talked about enough because it's so vitally important. Tell me if you agree with this statement as a perfect, like lead in to kind of peel the onion. The, the inbound SDR is the first public face of the organization that the vast majority of your clients are going to see. 
Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that a million percent. And the reason why is because connection rates on on inbound are through the roof, right? The the meaningful conversation metrics are literally four or five x higher than the outbound function. Yep. Right. On inbound, it's a customer journey map. As in, from the time they engage with a ad that then drives into a landing page to the first interaction with an SDR and then a warm, very thorough handoff to an AE, right? All of that will will impact the lifetime value of a customer. Yeah. And and how do you think about or think through, especially maybe in through the lens of the culture you're looking to create over there at Bill, um, how do you kind of like institutionalize this is, you know, look, you have ownership and freedom to do, you know, kind of things your way, but we want the the first impression, right? Like they never said, what's the statement? You never get a second chance to make a first impression. And yeah, if I've just yeah. filled out a, a lead form, or if I just discovered you on my path to solving my problems, and I raise my hand, and now I've got an in, inbound, you know, SDR calling me up with those high connection rates, how do you coach for mindset and kind of like that customer experience um, that you want to have each and every time? That is a great, great question. And I'm glad you asked that because, you know, one of the things that Jocko really talked about is discipline equals freedom. Yeah. Okay. So when I say freedom of the SDR to do whatever they want to, what, to hit their number, to run their team as an LLC, even LLCs work within rules of engagement. Yep. Right. And so the guardrail during onboarding for an inbound rep is really around, hey, these are, these are what the disciplines look like, and this is what will lead to freedom. Right. And so some of the things that, that we go and measure are time to contact, right? Um, ensure that they're able to answer the question rather than just go checkbox as if you're going to call the doctor's office, right? Um, to ensuring that, you know, they view the AEs as their internal customers. And when they do hand off, it's not just tossing them over the fence prospect, but more around like, hey, this is so and so. This is what we talked about. This is what what expectations were communicated and I'll leave you in so-and-so's capable hands. Nice. That's great. Cause then you get both ends of the spectrum, right? Like the time to contact is essentially saying, here's your job on the front end. Here's what we're measuring. Here's what's important to the organization, right? Like discipline equals freedom. And then here's what's happening on the back end. You know, like your handoff to you being a, a relevant staple in our sales cycle that leads to these outcomes when successful of a great handoff. Yep, exactly. And, you know, I'm not saying like everything's rainbows and butterflies and perfect, right? But oftentimes when we do run into any friction points, right, whether it's a client or a prospect that had a distasteful experience or something was misleading, you know, one of the things that I really pride on is that we have this partnership with marketing that is not seen anywhere else. Right? Tell me more. M marketing is vested in our number just as much as we are vested in theirs. Right? When we need real-time changes from marketing, it happens in real time. Right? And this all started during the pre-acquisition Divi days where you know, we're able to really communicate how are we going to move the needle because ultimately inbound is responsible for the velocity of the revenue org which means they are, there needs to be fluidity. They need to be moving quick and in real time. And there's been countless experiences where it's like, hey, you know, so -and -so, this prospect is upset because of this misleading verbiage, right? They fixed in real time. You know, the most recent experience is like, hey, my inbound SDRs are all caught up on their overdue task. Um, they, need, they need a shot in the arm and Within hours, a campaign is whipped up together, and all of a sudden, the lead forms are flowing like crazy. Right? It's it's the partnership with the internal stakeholders that I, as a leader, will continue to go and go and nurture and and um, procreate type of thing, while the SDR are continually in execution mode. That's great. Um, so, my guess then, just the way you describe that, is is mar marketing 
is not necessarily where you roll up, but it is a partner mat matrixed in as part of your, your organization. Yeah, exactly. We, you know, there's, there's companies that have placed their SDRs in the sales function and then either, and then the marketing function, it ends up always becoming a tug of war. Yeah. Right. But you know, we have a very, very healthy blend because we're also obsessed with our internal customers, our AEs numbers, right? I'm measured on X, but I'm also very vested in Y and Z. That makes complete sense. Um, I like that word too, obsessed. My guess is that there's probably also another dimension to that time to contact metric where, you know, the, the lower that is, um, my guess is that the happier and the more effective the sales cycle behind it, largely because when you, I think this is golden rule territory too, isn't it? When you're a client and you fill out a form, the shorter the time you have to wait for that company to get back to you, um, like the better. In fact, the longer, the more you kind of feel almost disrespected or like you're a number or like totally. people don't care. Yeah, there's, there's that gives a crap metric, right? Where it's like, I know there's a lot of great sales books. I actually have two dozen of them right here just next to my, my desk. Um, but if I were to TLDR every single book, yeah, it really comes down to like people buy from people that actually feel like they care, they validate, right? They want to help solve problems. And so, you know, early on, we started to measure time to contact. And then that turned into time to demo held. And then that turned into time to close one. And we continually evolutionized because it's like if time to contact there, then all the middle of funnel, bottom of funnel metrics should play along as well. Right? Yeah. And we started to see that. And so, you know, to your point, the urgency really communicates to the prospects throughout their buyer's journey. Like we care, we care to the point where we will call you with under X minutes and it doesn't stop here. The AEs will also represent the same type of, same type of urgency, ownership, excitement, all the way to your time as a customer. I mean, you know, we, we uh, take a look at NPS scores of our customers and it should all be aligned to their very first interaction to you know, the lifetime value of their experience here. Yeah, and it's, it's so funny too, because I almost think of this through my own little marketing lens where, um, you know, you say the words NPS, net promoter score, obviously a very well-known marketing term. Um, but where does that come from, right? Like it comes from an opinion around, you know, it's one question, how likely are you to recommend this company's product or service to your colleagues or friends? And, you know, the, the methodology is, I think, sound, but it, it, it's really more of a feeling, isn't it? It's capturing that feeling of like, how much do I feel valued by this company? Totally, totally. You know, I uh, I have this uh, this experience where it's like you you read you you read the press and it's like there's a lot of there's a lot of like negativity around Elon Musk Tesla and whatnot right yeah but if someone asks me hey how likely are you to recommend Tesla it's not just like hey this thing that's important to me right now at this moment it is a like a maze a a cyclone a typhoon of memories of how I've had how I've had with every single experience there. Yeah. Right. So, you know, it's a, it's a very simple question. How likely are you to recommend? Right. And I hope that the customers that we have, when they're asked, how likely are you, are you to recommend Bill or Divi or any other company out there? It always goes back to what was my first initial experience with the SDR? And then how did it translate from stage to stage? Yeah. Yeah. And, and together collectively, that's a buying experience, isn't it? Exactly. And the exactly. better the buying experience, the more sales will be made, the higher your close rates, the shorter your deal cycles. I mean, all else equal, aren't those the things that really move the needle? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a book that, that I really love reading. It's uh, To Sell the Team by Daniel Peake. Yeah. Love that book. Right. And it's, it's not just like, oh, the cell's done. Your job is done. No, you, you represent the whole experience from start to finish. Right. In enterprise SDR, it, 
it's more prevalent to that than SMB and mid market, right? Because it's all about relationship nurturing and fostering, you know, enabling your champions to always win and then being a true partner, right? I almost see it as like a board of directors, right? A buyer needs to start creating their board of directors. And that is based on trust. That is based on experience. And that's based on overall a healthy MPS score. Oh, that's great. More build out of that LLC. Um, you know, to sell as human, one of the, the things that I loved about that book was, you know, Daniel Pink laid out three themes that most people find when they find their jobs like really fulfilling and, you know, they're in a career that they they love. It's autonomy, mastery and purpose. You know, in this interview, we've, we've covered significant amounts of autonomy and and how you you give it uh, going forward. I'd love if you would comment um, whether you're thinking about it deliberately or now because I've asked you around mastery and purpose for your, your, your STRs. Yeah. I mean, purpose, what that means to me is mission, right? What's the whole purpose of the SDR function, right? right? You look at Simon Sinek, the why, and if they're like, Oh, I'm money driven. That that's a result. That's a what? Yeah. Right. But, but what is the true why? Right. And for us right now at Divi, it's really enabling the SMB function to be able to, you know, make expense tracking super seamless, right? Um, the purpose of why they, why tag to contact matters, why cost per lead, cost per opportunity, why all that matters. And you know, what I, what I do with the team is I have full transparency and show them, Hey, this is the metric. This is where, where, why, and how these are set up. And then be able to have them narrow it to themselves on what their purpose is. Right. Well, and, and even back to mastery, it seems like maybe the measurements are what goes into kind of like, you know, again, time to contact and quality conversations. It's like, okay, I could use those two metrics to tell me whether or not I'm mastering, you know, my craft day in and day out. Couldn't I? Exactly. And the mastery part, that's where the platforms come in. Yeah. Right? That's it's right. a map. It's a guide to show them, okay, how do you master this? What's the saying where a, uh, a goal without a metric is just a dream or something like that? <laughs> if that's not the saying, it should be. Right? It's like, yeah. I've, I've heard it countless times, but you know, at the end of the day, the mastery comes down to how the metrics are, are measured, how it's attained, and ultimately how does it move the, the needle forward for business. Yeah. So key. So key to getting an organization, you know, fulfilling the dream of, you know, being really good executors. Um, you've got all the components kind of like laid out. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, it took a while to figure out. Right? And I'm not saying I haven't figured it, all of it out yet, but what I do know that works are go find individuals who are insanely passionate, go create the best process to fully enable these passionate individuals and they create metrics and milestones to go and fully deliver on, on mutual, you know, indicators for the business, for the prospects, for the customers and for themselves. And that's how you create a win formula for companies. Yeah. Not, not that complex, but deceptively hard to, to do. You know, yeah. <laughs> no chat GPT will replace this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah, you can't automate any of what you're saying away. Now you can use chat GPT to help you on that journey. I messed around with open.ai and my mind was alone. Like it, it created additional rabbit holes, tunnels, and I'm like, wow, you can create sequences with, with open.ai. It's crazy. And so yeah. I'm excited to see how this will be adopted by the B2B top of funnel function. And ultimately it will further enable the reps is, is how I'm seeing it. It's surprisingly good at what I like to call normalization, um, where you can kind of like, I actually think my little hunch on where things go from here, especially with open AI and other tools like it that are, you know, working off of chat GPT three, three, five, and soon to be four um, is I think we're all going to get really good at prompting 
like loading prompts into the tool to get the kind of out answers and outcomes, you know, saving us like my prompt is two or three lines where I'm asking, Hey, write a cold email sequence or write, you know, personalized approach, do this, you know, give me the, the key phrases for this company that I'm looking to penetrate. Those prompts are, are where the gold is um, because that normalized result that comes back out of the tool is just so much faster and more efficient than anything we could do ourselves as humans. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very intriguing and it's, I mean, I can see it also become like, Hey, tell me more about X company, right? And that's the yeah. prompt, right? And, and it will give you a whole debrief and then following up with, Hey, what is this company's strike zone? That's where it's going to get very, very crazy because it's like, you have to look into the CRM to go and identify what people's strike zones are. It's not, it's much more than just industry title, revenue, employee count software, right? It's like what, what, and what makes our best customers and how do we replicate that? Right. Even at science, and I was like, Hey, Eric, who are your best customers and why? Right. Yeah. And those are things that the AI will have to eventually learn, but I think the next decade here will be absolutely crazy with, with how far this will take us. I think so too. And I'm, I'm actually really excited and fairly optimistic. I don't know, maybe this is a danger. Um, <laughs> about the technology and, and its enabling features, because I, I, I agree with you. I don't think humans um, get kicked out of the loop because, you know, here's the thing. I don't know how many satisfying experiences people have without humans in the loop. You know what I mean? Like, I think that there's a strong need for connection for like you, you open the podcast talking about relationship building and, and, you know, like one human being to another, um, I don't know, maybe I'm quaint and old fashioned that way. But I also think that, you know, with tools that make those conversations more enabled, higher level, more informed, you're, you're almost like turbocharging what a human relationship could or should be. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I keep using this car analogy. And so I apologize to the listeners who are like, oh, here he goes again with, with the cars, right? But, you know, the Tesla, for example, the technology, the AI, all of that that's built into it, it's absolutely insane where at the end of the day, it enables the driver to continually still be connected with the passengers and whatnot and still be able to get to point A to point B in the most safest way possible, right? Yeah. Going from my daily driver to the family car that I drive maybe once a week and forgetting like, oh, I need to actually step on the brake in order for, to make the car stop and whatnot. Like that's, that's where the chat GPT really comes into play. It's like it's designed to enable people to go further and turbocharge, as you said. Yeah. Right? Without it, it's still manual work. It's, it's still human error, whatever it might be. Things that will slow down, you know, the customer journey at the velocity of these customers and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of manual work is where a lot of, um, you know, soul crushing, you know, types of uh, <laughs> memes come from, you know, I don't know a lot of humans that they're going to be sad to leave behind repetitive tasking. They won't be, you know, but if you can make those repetitive yeah. tasks, like at, done at a higher level or done where the human kind of like spirit shows through all of a sudden they become meaningful. Yeah. And honestly, like that's, you know, like the whole mission of Divi is like, Hey, let us help you take care of your expense management so that you don't have to do it anymore. So you can focus as a business owner on bigger, better, greater things. Right. Right. Same as the same exact things with these tools, right? Outreach got us to, Hey, let us take care of your sequences for you. Let us help us. Let, let us help you SDRs with the follow up so that you can go continually focus on meaningful conversation. But chat GPT, it's like, okay, let us go create the sequences for you and help you with strike zones and whatever evolution comes from this so that you as an SDR can continually focus on the things that matter most that technology can replace. Yeah. Well, and who knows, maybe when we're doing a retrospective, we'll, we'll set a date for 10 years from now and we can comment about how much tech has changed everything about the SDR role, much like you led with uh, how much it's changed for you over the last decade. Maybe it's yeah, just absolutely. Yeah. It feels like it. I wouldn't be surprised if we're in robots the next time we're talking. 
<laughs> love it. Robot suits. <laughs> well, on that note, uh, this is a perfect time to just kind of let the the listeners know for anyone that might want to dig in or, you know, kind of like get to know you better, focus in on any of the the, the points of discussion that, that they might find meaningful in their world and connect with you, where should they go? Yeah, so connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, you can look look me up, Hunjin Lee, H-Y-U-N-J-I-N. Funny enough, my first name is all next to each other on the keyboard, and it's an upside-down Dorito. Um, no chat TPT can hack this password as well, a.k.a. my first name, so feel free to use these things as you need to. But uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I believe that the SDR function as a whole requires a village, right? It's, it's a, it's a, a community-wide initiative here. Um, and so very passionate about the work that we're doing and here to help in any way, shape, or form. Well, this has been a great discussion. I really enjoyed it. And so thank you for taking the time. Awesome. Likewise, Eric, thanks for reaching out and happy to be on here. You bet.